Welcome back to Medical Monday. Happy New Year to you, by the way. Thanks for being with us tonight on this cold January night. I have Dr. Jack Erder here with me from Tennessee Oncology. Thank you for being here once again. Thanks for having me. We've covered a lot of topics tonight when I it comes so. to blood cancer. One thing we haven't talked about, signs and symptoms. Sure. What should people watch out for? What should make that light bulb go off? So the, the things that people tend to, and it's funny, I'll have people present and say, I was dealing with this for a year before oh, wow. I got diagnosed with, with, with you know, whatever the case may be. But certainly um, unexplained fatigue. So, I mean, really can't get out of bed, like extreme, extremely tired, weight loss, um, chills, night sweats. These are sort of common symptoms that we see, certainly in large lymph nodes, although that's generally you know, most people would get that checked out, mm -hmm. um, I've found, but, but in terms of, you know, the, the sort of general symptoms people tend to have that are really a tip off that something bad is wrong, I think would include, you know, fatigue, unexplained weight loss, unexplained fevers, drenching night sweats where you have to change the sheets and everything, because it was just, just you know, really mm -hmm. profound. Do you see blood cancers target any certain age group or ethnicity? You know, interestingly, it's pretty pretty across the board. There's certain things that we see in slightly higher propensities in different different groups. So African Americans have a slightly higher rate of myeloma. Um, you know, certain non-Hodgkin lymphomas that we see more in you know younger folks, although they, they're seen in older folks too. Um, but you know, by and large, I think that that blood cancers tend to really not know any you know boundaries or or, or um, you know, lack of, of some victim, as it were. So if you're noticing a couple of these symptoms and you've put it off as, you know, maybe I'm going through menopause right. or, you know, oh, it's just whatever, you know, I've just, uh, I'm just been busy, I'm so tired, I'm just been busy. And What's the step you take? You go to your, your GP, your mm -hmm. family doc and say. Right, I'm not feeling right. And they will typically at least run what we refer to as a CBC, complete blood count, to see if anything is obviously wrong. Um, you know, most often with these, you know, for, for instance, someone who's very fatigued, it's often just a mild anemia that's due to n nothing cancerous. Um, but, but they also are the gatekeepers to, you know, making referrals to people like me. And uh, they typically do a really good job of it. I mean, I'm, I am always impressed that if you're a, a GP, you really have to be ready for anything that comes anything. to the door. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes they'll send me stuff that to me seems kind of, you know, low level or, or silly, um, you know, making the patient come see me. But then when I'm thinking about them going through 40 patients a day and having to figure out is this serious or not, I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think they, most, most GPs I work with, they are on the side of taking symptoms and, and, and abnormality seriously, even if they're minor, and, and I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, without a doubt, you want to yeah. be better, be safe than sorry. That's, that is definitely the. As I was reading through all the materials you all provided me, something that kept kept coming up was the community-based cancer care. Right. You all really stress this at Tennessee Oncology. Why? What is it, and why is it so important? So we are, as as I was talking about earlier, you know, a really large practice that, that delivers cutting edge. Um, cancer care by any measure and whether you measure that by you know clinical trials and new drugs whether you measure that by um, the uh, you know practicing up-to-date standard of care you know circa yesterday circa this minute um, care for any you know any number of cancers um, we, we offer all of that the, the community-based part though I think is what really sets us apart which is to say that we are located at every hospital you know, in Middle Tennessee, except for Vanderbilt, um, for obvious reasons, and um, at most outlying communities within about a 60 to 70 mile radius of Nashville. I do a, so for instance, I do a clinic once a week in Pulaski, mm. where, um, you know, I just go down to Pulaski, see a full slate of patients, we deliver chemotherapy there, you know, set up imaging and other referrals that are needed there. And uh, so we kind of bring the, the care for even, you know, quite, difficult to treat cancers there. down there. Yeah. I've had some patients down there where, you know, sure enough, their best option was a clinical trial that we had open in Nashville and we set that up if, if it's needed. Um, but, but, you know, 98% of it is, is, are things we can, you know, bring to the patient in their community. And for the vast majority of patients, especially when they're also dealing with cancer, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's important where they're not having to get in the car and drive for 40 miles each way for each visit. 
Sure, uh, and they can be surrounded by family. They yep. have that system in place. They can be close to church or, or wherever they need to be. And, and, and along, you know, when, when using the word family, I mean, that's one of the things I think we also tend to bring to the table, which is that they know all the nursing staff, the front office. It's very easy to get in touch with me and, and, and you know, my extenders. And, and, and I think that, that patients get a lot of, um, you, not just satisfaction, but I think comfort, you know, sure. that, that there's, there, and, you know, we have, I have patients who come back for their yearly, hey, how you doing? Blood work looks great. They still come back and see the nursing staff and give right hugs. And they're just, you know, that, that, that is a very common scenario for us. And, um, and that's something that I think you're not going to find outside of that community-based setting as much. Yeah, I would, I, I would imagine after you go something like go through something like cancer with a doctor and with these nurses, they do become your family because they, they've been down in those trenches with you like you Absolutely. were talking earlier. Yeah. Okay, we have Robert on the line. Robert, thanks for being part of Medical Monday tonight. What's your question? Uh, yeah, I was diagnosed with CLL a couple of years ago now, and I've got a white blood count of 21, uh, and it's kind of creeping up as time goes on, but yet uh, I'm still not ready for chemo or anything like that. Um, and I was just wondering if it was maybe because of age. Uh, they stopped short of telling me it might be because of age, you know, that I'm not, that I can't do chemo. Uh, and then I've also been told that it really wouldn't uh, cure the cancer. It would just, you know, it, it really wouldn't help because it would just come back. Or, or So I'm just trying to get some ideas on, on what's going on. Robert, how old are you? 60 years old. All right. Well, that's a great question, Robert. And um, so, so with, with CLL uh, specifically, that is a very interesting disease, and and, and it is one where certain um, I, I touched on this a little bit before. Certain genetic factors really play into how people do. I tell you, most people who diagnose with CLL are actually a good bit older than sixty, mm -hmm. and so you know, I don't think it's age. From the sound of it, it sounds like you have very, the, the word we ten, tend to use in oncology is indolent, just meaning well behaved, you know, not really acting out of control um, disease. And, and with CLL, the, the white blood cell count being elevated and that being your only issue, we, we call that stage zero CLL. I mean, this is, I have patients who have, you know, 10 years since diagnosis and their white blood cell counts 25,000, their other blood counts are normal and they've never needed treatment. So I think you're being, I think your case is being handled exactly right. And okay, because it started out at 15 when I was first diagnosed, and now it's up to 21. So. And, and, and that's pretty common, you know, that that slight creep up in the white blood cell count. But you know, I, take it from me, that that that's really not a big deal. You know, what what is a big deal are symptoms. Um, you know, developing low blood counts. I mean, that's where we start thinking about treatment the most is when someone becomes anemic or, or their platelet count gets low. And it doesn't sound like anything like that is going on. So that modest increase in your white blood cell count is it's really okay. Yeah, my, um, my lymph nodes are starting to swell just a little bit. Yep, and, and that's when people start thinking about treatment. The treatment options now are so varied, especially in CLL, including oral treatment, so just pills. Um, you're going to have a, you're, it's, you're, there's an embarrassment of riches in terms of how mm -hmm. to treat CLL now. So That's a good thing. Robert, thank you for being with us tonight. Best of luck to you. Thanks, Robert. Good. And, and you said before, we're wrapping up on time here, but you said before, always go out and seek that second opinion. That, that's never a bad thing. Nope. And, and if your oncologist is offended by that, you need to find a new oncologist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will wrap things up.